Hello and welcome to this special 10th edition of the Bravos Luxury Living Podcast. We're very excited to be uh, to get through our first 10. Um, if this is the first time you're hearing it or if you've heard it before, please remember to like, to share, to send to your granny, whatever you can, so people can hear this content. I have with me as ever Keith. Congratulations on 10 episodes, Keith. It got here pretty fast, didn't it? It did. Have we learned anything? That's the question after 10 episodes. I hope you've learned from me, if nothing else. I have. I always learn from you. And uh, for our special 10th uh, episode, we have a special guest. I'd like to uh, introduce and welcome Ryan Anderson, the CEO of Bravus and our beloved leader. Hi, Ryan. How are you? Never had a bad day in my life. How are you, Nigel? Good. Uh, seven levels above. Very happy, or as you put it, slightly less politically correct sometimes. So, um, <laughs> Ryan... Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about Bravos today. I, I really want to focus on, you know, clients, uh, customers, people building a home, renovating a home, the things they should think about. We we have a bunch of questions for you on that subject, but I wanted to start, maybe you could, uh, for people who don't know, tell the audience a little bit about uh, where you come from and how you got here. So I was one of the original owners that helped form Bravis uh, and, and owned a location in Kansas City called Elevate Electronics and was on the original uh, Bravis group that helped form Bravis uh, and then eventually became one entity. That's great. Now, as part of the team, we often describe ourselves as CAI or custom integrators. What does that mean? What, when people hear that, how, should you, how do you describe what we do? Uh, very simply, it, it's a mixture of blue collar and white collar, if you will. Um, CI is anytime there's a custom aspect. So a speaker that plugs into a power outlet and sits on your countertop uh, would not be custom, uh, but one that would be cut into the ceiling where a wire is run through your wall and the speakers installed in the ceiling would be a custom version of that. So there are multiple facets of electronics. Um, whether they're shades or lighting or speakers or TVs uh, that would cross the threshold of uh, custom. And there are a lot of products in the custom industry uh, that that have crossover. For example, a surround sound receiver uh, is a surround sound receiver, whether it is in a equipment rack in your basement uh, or whether you buy it off the shelf and, and have it sitting in your living room. The custom install side of that would be being able to remotely access it, control it, and have some additional features. So I see so much do-it-yourself nowadays that, you know, you can just about anything we could sell you as Bravis, you could sort of buy for yourself and do it yourself. What do you think is the big reason why you'd have someone like Bravis come rather than try and do it yourself? The overall experience uh, is is what changes with, with custom install. Um, I would posit to say that people can't do it themselves, and that's why they hire us. And if they can, uh, then, of course, I don't have any issues with supporting someone and helping somebody and wishing them good luck. Um, the average person can't build a car, so they would buy a car from Ford or Mercedes-Benz that's completely thought through, designed, engineered, uh, and has a good customer experience with a warranty. Uh, mm -hmm. certainly somebody could build their own car if they knew how and you know Ford nor Mercedes would try and stop them from doing that so uh, let, let's start the, the life cycle of a project when should somebody pick up the phone to Brabus when when should they first think about engaging an integrator like us to help them I have spoken at a number of builder events and what I say time and time again is as soon as one of the contractors says this has an app or there's a smart feature to this or it goes on your network because at the end of the day you're going to have a number of devices on your network all trying to talk to each other all trying to communicate and at some point somebody has to wrangle all of those and make those work together uh, it, as soon as you say hey uh, this HVAC system has an app or this, uh, you know, sprinkler system goes on your network. You should immediately have your integrator involved because at that point, somebody else is responsible for that item working correctly, operating on your network correctly and communicating with other devices correctly. And the more of those devices you start to throw into the system and then ask someone to 
uh, you know, take control of everything and make sure it all plays nicely. Um, and they've had no choice in what you've selected uh, or haven't been able to be helpful to guide you. Uh, you are, you know, obviously putting yourself more and more at risk for incompatibility. And, and that might be at the planning stage, might you? I mean, you might be looking at blueprints at that point rather than actually having started laying concrete for a foundation. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we, we uh, at Bravis, we work with uh, architects a lot because there's so much that needs to be thought through properly. Uh, lighting is a perfect example. Um, you know, a lot of times the, the house is done and the can lights are placed. Uh, and then we start to decide what you're going to do with those lights and how you're going to operate them. And you're limited to what got selected and where it got placed as opposed to from the beginning, being able to design the ceiling plan intelligently uh, and, and have can lights and speakers and HVAC vents all line up and play nice and look nice and operate correctly. Ryan, a lot of times you'll hear architects and interior designers just kind of defer the AV selection or the AV specification to the builder when that comes along. What would you say to those um, architects and interior designers that have never really been involved with working with the integrator uh, to encourage them, like what are they missing by letting someone else down the road start that conversation? Well, they're actually making themselves susceptible to uh, a, a poorly planned and, and uh, some eyesores uh, that could be part of the process by not being involved. And most designers that I've met want to be involved early so that they can control the process uh, I actually would be very surprised at a designer that said, I don't want to deal with that or I don't want um, to be involved in that because literally at the end of the project, they'll say, hey, this is my design. And then that's all the stuff that I decided not to be involved in. And so <laughs> no designer wants to say the part of the house that's pretty, I get credit for the part of it that's ugly is somebody else's fault. Uh, you know, I think every designer wants the whole thing to, to come together correctly. So I, uh, I'd actually be very shocked at a designer that didn't want to be involved. So you've had a Bravas team member work with you. They've uh, worked with the uh, designer and architect, and they're going to put a proposal. You know, we put a proposal in front of a client. From a client's point of view, what does a good proposal look like? What should they expect to see in a good proposal? A good proposal should be complete. And I'm so passionate about this because I, having, having been in the industry for so many years, uh, the most awkward conversation you can possibly have is, I didn't think you could afford that, so I didn't tell you about it. Uh, and the, the homeowner sitting with a finished home, he's just visited a friend's home or she's just seen uh, something else that, that you know, they're very interested in. And they ask you about it and then you turn to them and say, yeah, I didn't think that was gonna be in your budget, i.e. I didn't think you could afford it, so I didn't tell you about it. Uh, and the, the other downside is trying to guess that a client may spend, you know, X amount of dollars and making cuts ahead of time to try and meet a magic number. That is so very dangerous because that's communicating to the client that, that your guesswork of what they're going to like and where they want to spend their money, uh, is, is going to be the best solution instead of giving the client control and the ability to, to do that on their own. Uh, whenever I've worked with a client, I've always said, if you own a pen, you're in control. I'm going to show you everything and they'll have prices attached to it. And you literally just circle the things you like and cross off the things you don't like. But at the end of the day, the price is going to be all the things you circled. Uh, this should not be a process where you're forced into a uh, an end total number and you can't make changes. And, and, and conversely, there shouldn't be hidden stuff, should there? So that's another thing I, some of us experience from other people is that you suddenly discover there were things you didn't know about that you need to get done what you thought you'd agreed to, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I frankly find it insulting to, to say, oh, tires aren't included on the car. I didn't realize you'd want to drive it. Um, let's go ahead and add that to the proposal so that your car can function. It, it doesn't make sense to me. I'd rather have it all in there and have them say, I don't want heated seats or I don't need a heated steering wheel. Fine, we'll cross it off. We won't do it. No big deal. Uh, but to leave stuff off intentionally to uh, to make the proposal look smaller so it's more likely to be accepted, I think is is dishonest. How, how does a homeowner go about looking if they get multiple proposals and figuring out 
are they apples to apples? Which one here is not including everything? Because a lot of the front end stuff they recognize, the TVs, the speakers, the stuff they'll see, but a lot of the stuff needed on the back end, they have no idea if, you know, if both proposals are complete. So this is a, a age old debate in our industry. Um, do you line item everything out so that the client can see every last thing that they're, they're getting and, uh, you know, they have the ability to understand it and research it? Uh, or do you, do you group it and make it easier to digest, but, um, harder to really see master bedroom, $6,400. What am I getting for that? No idea. Um, realistically, a good proposal should be done the way the client wants it or expects it. Um, if you're doing a, a, a proposal for somebody who just wants an overview or high level and totals, that's how you should deliver the proposal. If you're working with an engineer or uh, you know somebody who is very, very, very detail oriented and wants to look at every last spec and look things up, you should be able to deliver it that way. Uh, I, realistically, the, the, the conversation should be had this is how I'd like to see this proposal. And that's really, really helpful. But there also has to be the flexibility to uh, be able to show the proposal in different ways. And all of the industry software is out there. It's a few clicks of a mouse to be able to deliver the proposal in different ways. And so there should never be any pushback on that. So, so now you've got this lovely proposal that Keith has spent hours uh, writing and drawing. Um, how much money should somebody put up front? Should they be paying for the whole thing? Let's talk about, you know, deposits and payments, because I know that's another gap some people fall into. Uh, another industry debate uh, I, I've seen, the worst case I've seen on a new home is 80% down. Uh, that's absolutely egregious. Uh, there should never be a situation where uh, the the, the company is asking for more of the money than, than it's necessary. One of the things that, that is most standard and fair is phases. So at the lighting phase where it's time to install your lighting system, you would get an invoice for the lighting phase. At the trim out phase, you would get a, an invoice for all of those. Sometimes those are percentages. Sometimes those are actual parts lists. But at the end of the day, uh, the amount of money that you're paying should be consistent with what needs to be ordered at that phase of the project. Uh, a retrofit project where somebody's going to do the whole thing at once is of course going to have a much larger percentage, but on a new home construction, you should be paying what's appropriate at each phase. How do you work out uh, sort of a mix between labor and parts? So, I mean, I, I guess if I'm buying a massive set of speakers in a home theater, that's going to be a lot more expensive in terms of technology. But what advice do you give people about that sort of ratio? You should expect as an industry standard 30% uh, of the labor uh, on a proposal. So a $100,000 proposal uh, should have about $70,000 of parts, 30,000 in labor. And that's not to say that this, this has to be the case in, in every instance. There may be more or, or less given different circumstances, but 30% is a very solid number. And why that's important to pay attention is if you have a $100,000 proposal with 10% labor, $10,000 labor, you may get all excited. But the problem is, is that company is poorly set up for success, poorly set up for uh, being able to do that correctly. They've mismanaged the project. So although upfront it may seem more exciting, uh, that labor usually gets charged at the end. And even if it gets eaten by the company, uh, that, that money is actually holding up projects, uh, causing mismanagement and has a horrible customer experience because uh, everything is late and, and planned poorly. If you were to tell a customer that something's going to take a month and it takes three months, uh, even if you saved 20 grand, those extra two months that you're delayed and the house is delayed, and move in is is delayed uh, are, are generally not worth it for the homeowner, especially if they're going to probably end up getting charged that in the end. <laughs> I, I like your optimism that that job is going to get completed by the company that was charging the ten percent labor. That's uh, in our market, in our market, we've had so many jobs we've taken over, and it ends up costing the customer more in the long run because now they've got to pay our guys to go in and re-engineer and redesign and figure out what was done incorrectly, and then go in and make it right. What a great point, Keith, because that that happens a lot when somebody hits that $10,000 labor mark 
and there's 20,000 labor left to be done. If they feel like they can't recoup that or charge that to the customer, that may be where they say, well, I've done $10,000 worth of labor. I've charged $10,000. You've already paid for the equipment. So I think this is a good time for me to, uh, you know, pull the parachute on this and it's never done pretty. Uh, so yeah, it, it, having a quote that is inclusive and proper uh, is really critical to success. One more follow-up question on that. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing on some larger projects with architects um, in the Dallas market, especially when we're not directly competing with another company, is we'll give the client a, a rough budget based on just a conversation about their house, then take a small deposit so that we can actually do a significant design and engineering kind of feasibility study so we know exactly what goes into that project. How do you see that kind of on that continuum of ways to do business with a client? That is a sign of a very good architect um, because a poor architect will put a drawing together and say, that's my job to make drawings and have some stamps on it. Um, a really good architect is looking for the client's success at the end of the project that it actually came to fruition. So first of all, that's a sign that you're dealing with a really good architect when they've done that um, and they've mapped that out and they've helped that. But once a company is engaged, and they're not just randomly bidding, but they're they're being paid to execute, uh, then everything that's gonna come out of that company at that point, um, they, they're being held to and uh, and they're being held accountable for. So it, it, it has a different sense of engineering and documentation when they know they're actually going to execute this as, as opposed to uh, randomly bidding something saying, I'll deal with this later once I get the job. Yeah. It seems almost unfair to clients because I think most clients would believe that getting as many bids as possible is going to give me the best project. But a lot of times the projects that turn out the best are the ones where one company got to really sink their teeth into it. They weren't aiming for a number. They were aiming for a result. Uh, and that's kind of what we've seen. Well, and, and the commercial world has, you know, the multiple bidding because at that point, no one's really got any passion or teeth behind it. It's get the TV on the wall and leave who can do it cheapest. And that's not what a homeowner for a, in the luxury space typically is after. So I want to, I want to move the ball forward. So we, you've written this great proposal the, the the client has worked out uh, how much to spend on it to, to be comfortable with the deal. Let's talk about what the experience should be like when the integrator starts. How would a, an end user, a client, a customer know they were getting good experience? What do you expect from people from Bravis when they go in? As soon as the deal is closed and there's a, the, the salesperson has uh, gotten a rich, and, rich uh, signed contract and a deposit uh, and engaged, a project manager should be, manager should be introduced. Um, one of the signs of a good uh, proposal is it's got project management fee on there. Um, if it doesn't have a project management fee, that's a great sign that you saved a little bit of money, but you may have saved money in the wrong space because your project manager is now the salesperson or uh, whatever installer is on that day and there isn't a point person. You know, every builder has a project manager, a job super, and a, a custom integration system sh should be no different. So the first sign of a good company is that they would tell you ahead of you signing that contract uh, who your project manager will be and what that process looks like. Are there clear signs, and I've experienced some of them, I know not with Bravis, but with somebody else, there are some signs on there that things are going badly. Some early warning signs are uh, uh, products not being ordered uh, in a timely manner and not being on site when, they, when they're needed. Uh, the back order excuse is really a poor one uh, because if somebody has planned ahead, they will have asked you for a deposit, you will have furnished the deposit, and then you will, they will have been able to order your stuff in plenty of time. Um, so the most of the materials we have, most of the products we have, uh, you know, given COVID, there are some examples, but, uh, you know, AV receivers, but they're not very common. And, you know, the, the integration company should really be giving you a heads up on when to order this stuff so that we don't have issues on back orders. What about when, um, 
you go into the kitchen and the and the installer has all the manuals out and all the you know is trying to make things work i mean I, that's the thing you must have heard of if not seen from bravis at least you know yes and no we are dealing with technologies that continuously change we are dealing with some some cutting edge uh types of products that would come out and somebody may be just checking a setting where there's eight pins and they've got to line them up uh you know if they've got the manual out for a for a tv mount then yes that's that's uh that's trouble i don't think that necessarily looking at an installation guide uh, is necessarily a bad sign as there's so many different pin placements and pin outs. Um, one of the things to check for early on is that your speakers line up with the can lights. Uh, and uh, you can see that at the construction phase as they'll be putting speaker rings or plastic rings in place and, before the drywall goes in. And you should be able to walk the house and look up and see if all of those line up. If they don't, then you've got an early warning sign that somebody really hasn't been thoughtful of how this is going to look once it's all finished. So we've talked about clients or uh, homeowners interviewing an AV company, but what should you be expecting? What should an AV, AV company or integrator be asking you for uh, when they're starting a project or trying to bid a project? The more questions that they ask regarding how you're gonna use the system and how you want the end finish to look are good signs. Uh, for example, the uh, you know the lighting schedule um, with the ceiling plan of where all the can lights are going to go and where all the fixtures are going to go is a really good sign that you've got a good CI integrator because they're actually thinking ahead of time how to line everything up speakers HVAC vents lighting uh, so that there's a a good plan of action before just getting there and seeing that the lights have been placed and now you've uh, you're stuck putting your your speakers wherever you get second or third choice in that ceiling plan. Another great question to look for is what size are the fixtures and what types of fixtures? Because you should know ahead of time whether they're getting three inch LED cans, four inch, five inch, six inch can lights, or whether they're going to be square or round or you know high end fixtures, because the speaker should actually be designed to match and look like the can lights. And you know having these beautiful tiny three inch LED fixtures throughout the house and these eight inch speakers uh, would ha would look obnoxious. And an installer wouldn't really know that until you've already signed on the dotted line and then they go to install and realize you bought an eight inch speaker and it's going next to a four inch can light and that looks awful. So asking that early is really critical. Um, so the work's gone on, they've done the install. Uh, why is it that some integrators seem to have such a job f finishing a job, that getting to the end of a job, you know, uh, like they're never gonna leave your house? What's going on there? They didn't have enough labor bid, which means that the person scheduling it didn't, didn't plan enough time, which means they've run out of time, they've run out of labor money, and they probably didn't have project management in place. Uh, generally you run into issues when, uh, the, there's poor planning and somebody underbid the labor, uh, as mentioned earlier, those are two really important factors. Um, once in a while you can run into something that, you know, you've got to, uh, chase a compatibility issue or when you're trying something new or something got thrown into you. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, every time somebody says, this is smart or it has an app or this has, uh, you know, goes on your network. An integrator can be at your house for an extra two, three weeks just figuring out how that, you know, robotic lawnmower is supposed to tie into the system when it got thrown in at the end or when the HVAC guy says, well, this is our proprietary system. It doesn't tie into your system and you've got to figure out a way to make that happen. So poor, uh, poor planning is how you end up in that situation generally, um, with of course some exceptions to that. And, and the moment of handover between the integrator and the client or the customer is a very important thing, isn't it? It's important people get taught how to use what they've bought. Yes, one of the most dangerous questions uh, that, that I hear someone ask is, what do you want it to do? Uh, you know. Think of the iPhone. If somebody handed you an iPhone and it had no apps on it, 
and then uh, and then you know the the salesperson says, "What do you want it to do?" And then you've got to start talking about what you want the iPhone to do, not even really understanding what an iPhone is. Uh, you know, no one would actually design the best situation. A good install company should already have the standard apps, the standard system set up. Uh, you know, every system that has a lighting system should have a good night button, should have a good morning button, should have a home button, should have an away button. A good CI company will say to you, okay, typically what we will do on a good night button is close all of the garage doors, shut the master bedroom blinds, turn all the lights off except for the master bedroom light, which might drop to 30%, uh, arm the alarm system. Would you like some additional things to happen when that uh, scene is hit or when that button is hit. That's how a good CI, CI company uh, has it planned. The warning signs are, well, this system can do anything you want it to, just tell us what you want. While that's true, that really is a blank canvas and it means that it hasn't really been thought out and there is not a standard or a structure in place. I think that's great advice because um, one thing is making it work and then the next thing is when it breaks, what happens? And and I'm even as company as good as us, things break, don't they? What what should clients or customers expect from service and support? Well, no one would ever uh, accept the answer during the sales process. Our systems don't break, or these electronics never go bad, or we never have issues, right? I mean, we have lots of electronic devices. Some of these things are $29 and are designed to do the most amazing things in the world, but uh, you don't put a whole lot of really high quality power supplies and processors into a $29 piece that's pretty critical. So we have to be prepared for that. There's two big facets to this. One is being proactive, being able to see that a device is down either before the client does or in a, in a quick um, proactive way. And the other one is a service plan. Uh, if you don't have a service plan and your integrator has not talked to you about a service plan, it means that when you have a problem, you will call them, you will let them know. And then at that point, their service department will decide how to react and what to do with no game plan and no insight. A, a service plan indicates that the company actually has a structure, that they're monitoring things, they're keeping an eye on things, and they're being proactive. Ryan, I, to follow up on that, when we started a dedicated service department in Dallas, I thought my clients were going to get worse service because they couldn't call me directly. You know, I was the sales guy. They want to talk to me when they have a problem. But we saw something very different, which was having somebody that really knows how to fix the system was a better service to them. How have you seen that work? I mean, kind of going from that old paradigm of they just need to talk to their salesperson to what a better system looks like for a client. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's exactly the case. The way that I, I phrase it is, you know, one of the best compliments uh, that's the worst situation you can get is Mike was awesome. I called him last night and he was at his kid's soccer game and he answered the phone and he walked me through it and he got me taken care of and got me back online. That's a great compliment. That means Mike is a great employee and, and did a great job and, and was able to execute but you just trained the client not to call or bother unless it's a real emergency. Now, the next time that client needs help, they're not gonna wanna bother Mike because it's six o'clock at night, Mike's big about family dinners and he's at his kid's sports and so I'm not gonna call and deal with that. And, and then next thing you know, the ball gets dropped, it's two weeks later, never got taken care of. Then you run into a, this hasn't worked in a while and what other <laughs> issues. We're training our clients to not call um, and take advantage of, of the service. And, and we don't want that. We want the client to be able to communicate uh, easily and directly and with no guilt. We want to encourage the clients to call us, not to say, you're really bothering me if you call me. Uh, why don't you deal with this uh, between eight to five when you're supposed to be at work and you're not home anyway? <laughs> so, yes. so, Ryan, in a minute, we're going to do our three wrap-up questions we ask uh, everybody who joins us on the podcast, as you know, but before we do that, is there anything you would want people to know about Bravs that you haven't had a chance to talk about? Is there something that you're particularly passionate about that we do that you'd like to make sure they know? Well, 
we want a unified customer experience a, a, across the country. Uh, and everybody should be able to have the same standards and the same setups. One thing about our industry is they're all custom made cars. Everybody does things a little bit differently. Everybody kind of creates their own homegrown system. And some are better than others. But the power of Bravis is being able to do 3,500 to 4,000 systems a year and know what works, what doesn't work, what's been tried, and to have that Mercedes-Benz experience, to be able to say, hey, these are the cars. Uh, you know, If we've got a glitch, we'll know about it. We'll be able to fix it and figure it out instead of, well, Bob built that car. Bob's not here anymore. Uh, we'll take a look and see if we can't figure something out for you. Uh, our, our, our customers, our clients at Bravis, deserve the horsepower of being able to have a, a true design and engineered system uh, with a known outcome instead of uh, let's put this all together and see what happens. Don't worry. I've done it a couple times before. Perfect. Well, listen, before we let you go, we ask everybody who joins us three questions. So I don't know if we warned you about this, but I'm sure you won't have any problems answering. The question number one, is there a piece of home technology, home automation or a gadget that you think you couldn't live without? Well, for me, it's a lighting system. And the funny thing yeah. is, my wife and I are moving into our uh, uh, to a new home, uh, custom built home in a couple of weeks. And the uh, lighting system is one thing that has to be done right away before you move in the day you move in. Uh, because we have found that uh, you can deal with just about everything except walking the entire house and turning off uh, every single uh, light switch throughout the house. It's just it's not really feasible after you've had a good night button. Absolutely. Second question, is there one job in your time as a, an integrator you've seen that strikes you as like a magic or the most amazing job you ever did? We have one uh, job that we did that I'm very, very proud of. And, and, you know, we've got a number of jobs that are, you know, seven figures that really have so much automation and so much technology and, and really neat systems. But one of the things that I'm so passionate about is anybody can sell you a speaker, but taking the time and the, and the, the ability to make it sound really good. Um, you know, anybody can sell you a, a light bulb, to, but to make sure that it's the right color temperature, that it lights the space correctly. Uh, we did a, um, a live performing arts center with Macintosh and Sonus Faber equipment that's really reserved for uh, home playback. And no one's ever done that before. And when we were done, we actually had live musicians play and you could compare what they were playing live the instrument on stage to the speaker as you walk to the back of the room and it was mind-blowing um, how accurate these systems were and if you're kind of into that you know high-end audio world uh, knowing that that we can recreate that and have it be true and perfect uh, has really changed the way I listen to music. Interesting. Okay, last question. Is there a gadget that is yet to be invented? Is there a problem you think technology is yet to solve that uh, if Keith and I ever need to go off and set up a separate business, we should focus on? Yeah, easy. Voice control. Uh, you know, it, it's there. We have it in every system. We can do it. But my clients always say, hey, uh, do you have voice control? And I say, I absolutely do. Do you use Siri on your phone? Nine times out of 10, I go, I get no, because it's it drives me nuts. Uh, she never gets it right. And I say, okay, well, mine isn't better than Siri. It's about the same. So we have it. We can do it. If you can perfect voice control, uh, you, you, you've hit a grand slam. But you should probably not waste your time on me. You should sell that to Apple or Google if you perfect voice control. <laughs> All right. Well, that gives us something to think about. Listen, Ryan, thank you very much for taking the time for sharing these insights. I think it'll be useful for everybody you know, who's building homes and preparing homes and starting to get into this technology. Thank you for spending the time with us. Thank you for having me.